Welcome to the house of the Lord. Um, but before we start anything, um, I just want to I just want to read out of Psalms 121 that my wife read this morning as we were praying and praying for Israel. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, 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 he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go both now and forever. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you Israel to you today, Father God. Your scripture says, indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps, Lord God. You are not asleep, Father God. You are attentive to what's going on in Israel, Father God. We pray for a shield of protection, Father God. We pray that the seas of fire would end, Father God, Lord, that you would continue, Father God, having your way with that nation, Father God, and the surrounding nations, Lord God, who go against Israel, Father God. And we pray, Father God, for the rescue, Father God, operations, the military, Lord God, those who have been taken hostage, Father God, that, Lord, Lord, you would touch the heart of those terrorists, Father God, that they would release families, children, Lord God, the elderly, Father God, in communities, Father God. We just pray that right now, Father God, touch the heart of the wicked, Father God. Lord God, Lord, we know that the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy, Father God. Lord God, you're not surprised, you're not in shock what takes place, Lord God, around the world. You know all things, Father God. Let us be at rest, let us be at peace, Father God, because, Lord, you're still working, and you will still continue to work, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that this nation, America, and those, Lord God, in the U.N., Father God, will, would, would provide the support needed, Lord God, Lord God, for a, a recovery, Lord God. And, and I just pray, Father God, for... Uh, the most important thing, Father God, that, Lord, we as a nation, we as your people, Father God, would pray and lift up this country to you, Father God. We love you and we're thankful, Father God. We ask for a shield of protection, your love, your protection, your shield over Israel today, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Anybody get caught up in a little traffic this morning? I don't know what was going on. I don't know if it was an accident or, or there was a road race, but, uh, but you're here, which is the most important thing. Amen? Amen. God is good. God is good. Can we give Brother Dave and Genesis, our worship team, a hand? Amen? Amen. Appreciate you, Brother Dave. Appreciate you guys. Amen. Amen. I'm excited. Good to see everybody here in the house of the Lord. Love you, Johan. Amen. Amen. Um, everyone has experience being in control or having control. Amen? Amen. Just a couple of us, right? Everyone likes to be in control because it makes us feel safe. It makes us feel safe to a certain degree. It's, it's human nature. It's human nature to try to be in control. However, it's challenging, and it ch how it, it's, it's challenging, and it could be unhealthy when we try to stay in control too long. Amen. It's not a a healthy thing for us spiritually to try to stay in control of our lives and circumstances. It's unhealthy. We can't do anything without inviting the Lord to relieve us and give us that peace from all that we're trying to control. How many of us are trying to control certain things in our lives, including our own lives? Amen? But see, our, our, lives, our lives belong to the Lord. They belong to the Lord. Romans chapter 14 verse says, says this, if we, be, if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, 
we belong to the Lord. So we belong to the Lord. The Lord is in control of our lives. We belong to the Lord every day. We belong to the Lord every moment. We, we live because he's in control of our lives. He's in control of our lives. So as long as we live, we must honor and have reverence, have reverence that the Lord is in, is in control of our lives and everything surrounding our lives. Is that fair? Can, can we release and give the Lord control of our lives, our circumstances? Because it, we, we can't do it by ourselves. And sometimes we, we're, we're trying to hold on to things that we cannot control in our lives. So if we live, we live for the Lord. So if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. He is in control. Tell your neighbor, he's in control. He's in control. The title of our message this morning is entitled, Godly Cruise Control. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that, Lord, we're in your presence, Father God. You've been here already. We ask that, Lord, uh, we, we would open our hearts and our ears and be attentive to what you have to say to us today through your holy scriptures, Father God. Bless, bless, and anoint my lips, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. You oppose the proud, but you give grace to those who humble themselves. I humble myself before you, Lord God. I humble myself, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you give us the privilege to be able to share the gospel, Father God. And I respect you, and I respect the word of God, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In your car, and in most cars, there's a feature called cruise control. That feature was invented in 1948 by an American engineer, Ralph Tidor. Cruise control is that feature, if you've ever used it, that helps reduce the fatigue of drivers for, for, for long distance. So if you're driving long distance and you've ever driven 8 to 10 to 12 hours, you know, you get fatigued and your feet get fatigued. The feature of cruise control are as follows. Here are the features, okay? Adaptive cruise control, restore, cruise, on, off, coast. Cruise control imitates the way human drivers drive. And the feature uses an actuator, it's an actuator, to press on the accelerator of the pedal so the driver sets the speed, hopefully, to the legal limit. Anybody use cruise control? Hopefully you set it up to the legal limit, okay, to give that driver that relief, that relief from the pedal. For cruise, to, cruise control to work, the operator must do one thing that's so important in order for it to work. You're going to have to release the pedal. You're going to have to allow that cruise control feature control the vehicle. So the driver must let the pedal let the pedal go and allow the actuator to activate so the vehicle is controlled. So cruise control only works, only works if you let go of the pedal. Once the cruise control is set. Now, figuratively speaking, for us to let God take over our lives, we must let go and surrender our control. Figuratively speaking. The same thing, we have to let go, we have to let go and surrender so the Lord can have control of our lives. Does that make sense? Amen? Just like the release of the pedal is required, to, required in, 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 in your vehicle, in cruise control, we must release our lives and circumstances to the Lord. We have to... Let go. We have to release it. We have to put God on cruise control and allow him to control your life, our circumstances. It's so important. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7 says the following. If you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, in his good time he will lift you up. Verse 7 says, let him, let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. There are two, two, two applications to, to these verses right here. They're not up there because they're, they're familiar to us, that we need to let go 
of all our worries, all our cares upon the Lord. But there's two things that we need to apply here. We need to, number one, humble ourselves. In order for you to let go, you need to humble yourself. We need to humble ourselves. The church needs to humble ourselves. So we humble ourselves. That's the first thing that we got to do. Then we have to let him have all our worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Letting him have all your worries. That means all your worries that concerns you. You have to let him have everything, which means you have to cast, which means you have to release, which means you have to let go of all your cares. Because at times, we have a difficult time of letting go and releasing things to the Lord. So the scripture tells us, humble yourselves, let him have it all. That's not a bad deal. If you love the Lord and if you, and if you obey the Lord and you surrender to the Lord, let him have it all. Let him have it all. Cast, release, let it go. Let him have all your worries and let go of the accelerating things that you have in your life that you can't control of. You can't control of. Put, put God in cruise control in your life. Put him in cruise control. He will be the one in control. He knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for your circumstances. He knows what's best for the church. He knows what's best for all of us. You need to know, we need to know that God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. Man, just like that feature works. Listen, God is in control. Click, click. That feature right there. That's it. Click. Like that. Click. That's all it takes. You got to do something. You got to do something. Your greatest responsibility, our greatest responsibility is to click. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing figuratively here because that's all that God wants. But we like to hold on to things. We like to be in control of everything. And it doesn't work that way. Proverbs 19.21 says, man proposes, but God disposes. Man proposes, but God disposes. Isaiah 55 verses Eight through nine. Listen to this. This plan of mine is not what you would work out. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. I'm reading from the Living Bible. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than yours. This is my plan. So who's in control here? If God created you before you were in your mother's womb, what makes you think he's not in control of everything else in your life? Hello? 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 Listen to this. Romans, no, Revelations 22, verses 13 from the Common English Bible. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Who's in control here? God is in control. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is God. He's the only one. There is no one like him. He prepared. He, his purposes are well established. He will do what he pleases. So who's in control? God is in control. He does whatever pleases him. God is definitely in control. He is the alpha, the omega, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end. He is in control. He does what he pleases. He does what he pleases. God is definitely in control. Should we stop or can we continue going? God is definitely in control. And that's something that we have to conclude that every one of us, every circumstance, and every event in your life is under the authority, the authority of our sovereign God. It's plain and simple. Every one of us, every circumstance, every event, including what's happening right now in this world, is under the authority and sovereignty of God, because we have a sovereign God who is almighty. Tell your neighbor, God is almighty. God is almighty. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? God is almighty. You better believe it. You better declare it. He is almighty. He is almighty. Tell your neighbor, I got a Greek word for you. Tell your neighbor, I got a Greek word for you. I got a Greek word for you. Pantacoreta. Pantacoreta. 
You know what that Greek word means? That means God Almighty. The Almighty is referred to by the Greek word pantakareta, meaning the one, meaning the blessed one, meaning the master, meaning the king of kings, meaning the Lord of lords, meaning that he's the ruler of the universe who is our God and controls everything. So can we take comfort, comfort knowing that everything that's taking place, everything that, everything that we don't even understand is under God's control, under his authority. And sometimes we don't understand why certain things happen, but God is still in control and has purpose for it all and for all of us. Even if you don't understand what's going on in your life right now, he still has purpose for it all and for all of us. It's a promise. But what happens is we try to figure things out and we try to hold on and try to control to so many things, and we got to let go. We got to let go. We got to put God on cruise control. So no matter what's taking place in your life, no matter what's taking place in this world, no matter the circumstances surrounding us, God is in control. And if we love God, if we love God, we understand this. Romans 8, 28, if we love God. And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. I love this translation. Let me read it to you one more time from the Living Bible. And we know, can we say we know, that all that happens to us is working. So God is at work. He's working for our good. But there's a conditional word here that says if we love God, if we love God and are fitting into his plans, we have to be fitting into God's plans. Everything has to be in alignment with God. If it's not in alignment with God, forget about it. You're going to have a flat tire. Because you know if you don't have your car properly aligned, what happens to your tires? Right? They stop wearing, 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 because they're not in alignment. And guess the next thing you know, you have a blowout. So things have to be in alignment with God. Things have to be fitting into his plans. And because God is in control, means that nothing happens without him. Nothing happens without him. He's in control. He's in control because he's the one, because he's ble- we, we have a blessed king. He's the master. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the ruler of the universe who is our God and controls everything. So nada happens without God. Nada happens without God. Nothing happens without him. Shouldn't this be an encouraging message to you, to us? This is so encouraging to us. It's so encouraging because let me just tell you, let me just tell you that nothing happens without him. Nothing happens without him. This is good news. This is encouraging to know that nothing can deceive and nothing can overwhelm and nothing can overpower the Lord. He's in control. I want to say that again. There's nothing that can deceive. There's nothing that can overwhelm God. There's nothing that can, can overpower God. He is powerful and all-knowing. And like Pastor Michelle said last week when she opened the service, listen, nothing surprises God. God doesn't say, I never saw that coming. I never saw that coming. Nothing surprises God. He knows it all. That's encouraging to us. It's encouraging to us. Despite how you feel, Despite what you hear, despite what you see, despite what others say, despite what others think of you, despite of what others think of our church, we have to be reminded that God is in control and he pleases. And, 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 and when we please him and when we obey him, listen, he's going to do whatever it pleases him. What does God want? He wants obedience. Saints who are pleasing him, who are pleasing him. So keep in mind that God is in control, that nothing can deceive the Lord, that nothing can overwhelm the Lord, that nothing can overpower the Lord. Nothing surprises him. No matter what we see, no matter what we hear, no matter what people are saying, no matter what others think of us, God is in control. God is in control. He'll do whatever pleases him. Psalms 115.3 says, 
but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. I love that. It's not up there, but I'll read it to you one more time. Psalms 115.3, if it's up there, great. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever. Can we say whatever? Whatever. That, that, that's, a, that's a good attitude to have. God does whatever he pleases. Right? Because when, when we say whatever to somebody else, it's kind of disrespectful. Right? Whatever, whatever. But here, it's a good thing. Whatever he pleases to do. Man, that's, 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 that's some power and authority right there. God does whatever he pleases. Hello. Get my soul. What, what's up? Hello. Hello. God does whatever he pleases. This is just, I just read a scripture to you. It's just a biblical trailer as we get ready to engage with our supporting scripture from, for our message. Turn your Bibles over to Mark 4. 35 through 40. Remember, God does whatever. Whatever he pleases. He does anything to any extent, no matter what. That's what he does. He's steady and he's unshakable. Psalms 107, 29 says, He hushed the storm to a gentle whisper so that the waves of the sea were still. Another trailer right before our supporting scripture. And when we think of this story and when we look it up, automatically we come across to that, that verse, verse 40, where, where, where we come across and it says, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? We think about that all already. It's the storm and, and, and the disciples ask Jesus, yeah, the, the Lord asks the disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still not have faith in me? We think of that story all the time. But what we want to do is we want to expose a little bit something, a little bit more in these scriptures. And we'll start with verse 33, 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So leaving the crowd, they took him and with them, just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. And a fierce windstorm began to blow, and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern asleep with his head on the sailor's leather cushion. Jesus was in the rear of the boat. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care? What we are, that we are about to die. And he got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still, muzzled. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. And the wind died down as if it had grown weary. And there was at once, can you say at once? At once, a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith and confidence in me? Amen. As we have just read, Jesus and the disciples had just finished doing ministry. How do we know that? Because it says in verse on, on, that it's on verse 36, so leaving the crowd, they took him with them just as he was. So that key word, leaving the crowd, meant that Jesus was, they were, they were ministering. Jesus had a, had, a, had a following. Jesus had a crowd. And we all know that they had just finished ministry. And to recap just a little bit of the story, because we always come up to that last verse, verse 40, and, you know, Jesus tells them, don't you have faith? Don't you have faith? But let's have a little recap of this story. The scriptures tell us that there was a storm. There was a fierce storm. There were heavy winds. The boat was rocking. The boat was about to break. Water was swamping the boat. Jesus was at the rear of the stern, at the rear of the boat, at the stern. What was he doing? He was taking a nap. Jesus was out probably tired, cold, sleeping like a baby, like nothing was happening. Sleeping like a baby. He was probably snoring. 
okay, sleeping like a baby. And the disciples wake him up and tell him, Jesus, you don't even care. Do you know what's going on here? Do you know we're in the middle of a storm? And Jesus is probably going like this. He's probably just waking up. Jesus was smooth. Amen? Amen? And, 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 and trust me, Jesus did not panic. But the disciples were in a panic because he's telling Jesus, they're telling Jesus, don't you even care? Do you know what's going on here? We're about to die. And let's, 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 let's not forget that the disciples were experienced fishermen. Experienced fishermen. So, so, so they, 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 they knew how to handle the storms and certain things. But in this case, they were freaking out with this particular storm because the scripture says that it was a fierce storm, heavy winds. The boat was about to break. It was rocking. Water was swapping the boat. And they're in a panic. They're in a panic. And these were experienced men freaking out in the middle of this boat, asking, are you going to do anything? Teacher, do you not care that we're about to die? Listen, folks, it's evident that the sea, the ocean, is one of the most powerful natural forces of our planet. And the reason I share that is because it's evident, because the earth consists of 71% Water, seventy-one. So, 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 the the, the water that surrounds us it, it covers a lot of territory, and we have a lot of territory. This this power when you have a lot of territory. And I remember growing up, my father would always used to tell me. And I don't know if if if, uh, if anybody's parents would ever tell him, you know, um, respect the ocean, respect the sea. My father used to always tell me, my father. My father's a great swimmer. My father was not to brag, but my father was. A, Swimmer. My father was a swimmer, but he always told us, I need you to understand something, son. You need to respect the sea and the ocean. You have to have respect. They are powerful. That's why 71% of the earth surface is water. The ocean in itself is 96.5% of all of the earth's water. Not that your pastor's smart. It's just the United States geological survey. That's where I got the information for so I haven't been in school for a long time. I was it was it 60%, 70%? I don't know how much water we have. Okay? But but it is powerful. And you know what happens? And 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 and, and there's this storm, and, and Jesus gets up and, and listen to verse 39. He got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still, muzzled. And the wind died down as if it had grown weary. And there was at once. See, we got an immediate God. The Almighty God is immediate. When you surrender to him, when you let go to him, at once, you should start feeling at peace. At once. At once. Try it. Give it a shot. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. Whenever is the time. God, I have to let go. I have to surrender. I need this peace. Because God is an immediate God. Instantaneous. He'll give you that peace. Because the scripture says that at once. That's the power of God. That's the power of the Almighty. It's at once. It's at once. But you're going to have to let go. You're going to have to let go. And at once a great calm, a perfect peacefulness, a perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith and confidence in me? The disciples were in a panic. We know that. The disciples forgot who was on that boat. They forget. They forgot. And we're forgetful people. We mentioned that last week. We are forgetful people. They forgot who was on that boat. Jesus was not your typical sailor. Jesus was the Savior. He was not a sailor. A sailor. He was the Savior. He was the one that was on that boat. And they're questioning Jesus. They're questioning, don't you even care? We're about to die. But the disciples forgot that the Pantocrator, the Almighty One, the creator of the universe, the creator of earth and heaven was on that boat. They quickly forgot that prior to stepping on that boat, prior to stepping on that boat, they quickly forgot that prior to stepping on that boat and going onto the ocean, that they themselves had witnessed Jesus. Okay, they had themselves witnessing Jesus 
his teachings, him performing miracles. He was healing. This is before getting on that boat. They, they were traveling with Jesus. They were eating with Jesus. They were at fellowship. They were hearing his teachings. Jesus was healing. Jesus was performing miracles. Jesus was displaying his power. And they quickly forgot the fact that he was driving impure spirits right before getting on that boat, that he was delivering people. He was healing people from leprosy right before getting on that boat. And quickly they forgot who the Savior was. They quickly forgot. All of this happens before chapter 4, and we're on chapter 4. So before chapter 4, Jesus was teaching, Jesus was performing miracles, Jesus was healing, Jesus was displaying his miracles, Jesus was driving out impure spirits, and Jesus was healing a man with leprosy. Hello, an eyewitness, an eyewitness. Shouldn't they have been a little bit more encouraged? Shouldn't they? And all of this was prior to chapter 4 of our supporting scripture we are currently sharing. We can easily forget what Jesus can do for us. We can easily forget what Jesus can do when we're in the storm and when we are consumed with taking control. That's how we start to forget. We start to forget about what Jesus can do, and we start consuming ourselves and trying to cons con control our situation, our life, our family, our children, our finances, our marriage, and our only responsibility that we have to do is say, you know what, God? I can't do it. I got to put you on cruise control. I need you to take care of all these circumstances and allow you to be on cruise control because I can't do it on my own. We like to take control. Yes, sometimes it feels safe. Yes, it's unhealthy to do it for an extended time period of time. And sometimes God places in that place where, yes, you're going to have to have a teaching moment and um, a teaching moment and recognize the fact that you can't do it on your own. You know? You know what a helicopter Christian is? Anybody know what a helicopter Christian is? You know what a helicopter does, right? A helicopter does this. It hovers. We're helicopter Christians too. We like to hover over all our circumstances. We like to hover over everything because we want to have control got to let things go. We can't hover over things that we cannot control. You cannot. We cannot. We got to let God go. Click. Put him on cruise control. Cruise control. Let's remember that the Lord does whatever. Tell your neighbor, whatever. Whatever he pleases. Man proposes but God disposes, and when he got up and sternly rebuked the, the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. Hmm. That's sometimes we need to hear. Be still and know that I am God. Shh, be quiet. Shut up, shut up. God is speaking. God is speaking. Shh, shh, shh. We have to tell ourselves, we need to be quiet. God is speaking. We need to be still and know that he is God. And the wind died down as if it had gone, grown weary, and there was at once a great calm and perfected peacefulness. I need you to stay with me. Stay with me as we bring this message home. The Bible doesn't give much detail. But let's open our minds just a little and place yourself on the boat with Jesus and his disciples. Just picture yourself on that boat. And that's just as Pastor Michelle was praying downstairs, and we were praying downstairs, and Pastor Michelle just said, why don't we just place ourselves on the cross <laughs> so we can recognize, you know, that we're sinners and what God did for us. So in this case, all I want you to do is just place yourself, place your mind in the boat with Jesus, with the disciples. And I bet, and it's not mentioned in the Bible, but I bet that the disciples themselves, we know that they were experiencing experienced fishermen, and they were probably monitoring the storm. They kind of felt, whoa, 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 this, this boat's getting rocky. We got something coming, okay? And they probably tried to take control of that boat. The scriptures doesn't tell us that, but, just, but, 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 you, but you need to just place yourself there because that's what's probably, because it happens to us. Let me, see, let me give it a try. 
Are you following me? Let me give it a try. I'm just, I just want you to open your mind. And they were experienced. They were probably monitoring the sea because they were experienced fishermen. And they, it was probably rocking. The boat was rocking. Some of them may have gotten seasick. I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. But at the end of the day, they were probably trying to control the situation. Doesn't that sound like us? Okay? They were trying to probably control the situation. It happens to us. Okay? They tried to control the situation while Jesus was sleeping. The same happens to us. We try to control our lives and circumstances around us. We try to assume control. Are you guys following me? We try to assume control because that's probably what they were trying to do. They were like, okay, let's see if we can handle this. But since they couldn't handle it, they were like, Jesus, wake up. Don't you see what's going on? Don't you see what's going on? We're about to die. Wake up. Okay? I really believe that's where they were at. It's called a place of surrendering, saying, you know what? We can't do this. We try to assume control. We try to cons- assume control. And when that happens, when we try to assume control, what happens is we disable the ability to receive the peace of God. When we try to assume control, okay, we disable ourselves the opportunity to receive the peace of God. When you let go, it says, what did the scripture say? That, that at once, I love that, that at once something took place. So when we release our control, our control to the Lord, something at once happens. Because it happened on that boat. That boat, didn't have, that boat didn't have cruise control, by the way, okay, if you're still awake. It did not have cruise control. But at once, but at once, God took control of that boat. Can I show it to you? It says, it says the following, that there are three things that happen when we allow God to take control. Three things. Number one, the Lord shows up. The Lord shows up. Number two, this is what happens when we allow God to be in control. Number two, there is great calm. And number three, there is perfect peace. At once. At once. There's perfect peace at once. But it's got to come from in here. Right in here got to be genuine. you got to be authentic with the Lord and transparent with the Lord and say, Lord, I surrender. Take control of my life. Take control of my circumstances. It's got to come from right here, deep down in your soul. And when that happens, at once, he shows up. At once, there's a great calm. And at once, there's great peace. How do you expect us to have peace when we're trying to control things? on our own, and we're not surrendering, God's going to be there. Okay, whenever you're ready, you let me know. Okay, whenever you're ready, you let me know. Okay, whenever you're ready, you let me know. God's fear. God is fear. God is fear. As I close, Manny, Mark chapter 439, once again. Jesus shows up, he got up, hush to the wind, and at once, a a great calm, a perfect peace. Additionally to that, let me just give you 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace himself, himself, no one else but himself, grant you that peace at all times and in every way. That peace and spiritual well-being that comes to those, to those, 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 really so important, those who walk with him, regardless of life circumstances. The Lord be with you all. Now may the Lord of peace himself grant you that peace. Amen? Put it on God, putting, putting God on cruise control is a good thing. God will not do anything until we let go. He will not do anything until we let go. I don't know what you're holding on to. I don't know what I'm holding on to. I have to repent. I have to confess as well. We all do. It's called surrendering. When you're at that place where you can just let go, it's that place of peace. Giving God control of your life, giving God control of your finances, giving God control of your circumstances, your family, your children, whatever it is, 
God knows. We just have to, we just have to stop being helicopter Christians, hovering over, over our situations, our concerns, everything, thinking that we can handle them, and we just can't. And as people, we don't like to surrender. We don't like to give that control over. And we don't like to admit the fact that we need help and we need peace. Amen? After holding on so long to the things that you're trying to hold on, it's, 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 it's exhausting. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It's distressing. It's peaceless. I think that's a word, peaceless. It's peaceless. So when you're trying to take control over things and you know you don't have control over them, it's, 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 it's exhausting. It's overwhelming. It's distressful. It's peaceless. And when you're in that place, you got to let's say, God, you know what? I need you to be in control. Give me that peace. And it's okay to be humble and it's okay to cry out to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with crying out to the Lord. There's nothing wrong. Psalms 37, 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, hallelujah, the Lord hears, hallelujah, and he rescues them from all their distress and troubles. So there's nothing wrong with crying out to the Lord. Nothing wrong to cry out for help because he hears, because he rescues, because he restores, because he refines. He's your refuge. So take refuge under the shadows of his wings because his feathers will cover you, will cover your circumstances, will cover everything. Because God is almighty. God is almighty. So I got a question for all of us today. And I want to invite the prayer partners to come up and get ready. What's keeping you from placing God on cruise control and receiving his peace? Because what you need to remember today is this. That there are three things that happen when we allow God to be in control. The Lord shows up. There is a perfect calm. There is perfect peace. And I give you a bonus out of John chapter 14, 27. Simple bonus. This is Jesus instructing and preparing the disciples before his departure. And he gives them this encouragement. Out of John chapter 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your, your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace, my perfect peace, calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength. This is strictly from the Word of God and the mouth of God. He says, peace, I, I leave with you. My perfect peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Three times, Lewis, three times he says, I, I, I. We have to pay attention when God speaks and he's mentioning things multiple times. And he says, I leave you this perfect peace that you cannot get from no one else. You can stand with me. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the peace already in this house, Lord God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. I'm going to pray, but the most important thing for today is for you to put God on cruise control. And one of the most important things that you can do is you can come up and ask for prayer. Our prayer partners are here to pray for you for whatever, because we serve a whatever God wants to do in Jesus' God. He's going to do whatever it takes to put you and place you at that peace that you've been looking for. But you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to surrender. And it's okay. No one's here. No one's here. 
to embarrass you or anything like that. I asked my wife twice yesterday to pray for me. Twice. Twice. In our apartment throughout the day. Hello. H honey, I need you to can you pray for me. On tape, just like that. Prayer's a good thing. Prayer's a good thing. Don't leave here without getting prayed for. Lord, we thank you for being almighty over our lives. We receive your word today, Lord. We acknowledge that you have divine control over our lives. We place our lives on cruise control, Lord God, to you, Lord God. You control our lives. You control our circumstances. Lord, we repent and confess today, Father God, that, Lord, if we have been tr struggling, struggling to control things that we have no control of, Lord God, we ask you, Father God, to intervene. We ask you to take over, Father God. We release our circumstances, our lives to you, Father God. You have control over all things, Father God. You have control over heaven and earth, Father God, and you also have control over us, over all our circumstances, Father God. You know, just calling us, Lord God, to confess and to repent, Lord God, that, Lord, we may, we may, we may have been trying to handle things on our own, and, Lord God, not any longer, Father God. We want you to be in control of our lives, Father God. We submit, we surrender to you today, Lord, believing and expecting that peace that surpasses all understanding, that only comes through you, Father God. That same peace that you, 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 you gave the disciples, Lord God, it's available to us today. You gave them specific instructions that there's no other peace that can come unless it comes through you, Father God. We receive that peace today. We receive your blessing. We receive your anointing over us, Father God, because we are your sons and your daughters, Lord God. Anoint us, Lord God, to do even greater things, Father God, through you, Father God. Just use us as your, your vessels, instruments, your ambassadors, your agents, Father God, to continue proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and exposing the love of Christ to others, Father God. As simple as it is, Lord God, to express your love to others. And you will take care of the rest, Lord God, because we can't change people, but you can, Father God. You can change the hearts of people, Father God. We ask for your blessing over the rest of this week, Lord God, as we come together for engage groups tomorrow, Lord, as we come, Lord God, on Wednesday, Father God, to come and pray together as a church, Lord God. Lord God, I pray and I invite everyone to join us. Lord God, it's an open prayer meeting, Lord God, which means that the room is open for everyone, which means that you can walk through that Zoom meeting at 7, 7.15, 7.30, 7.45, 8 o'clock, 8.10, 8.20, 8.30, Lord God. It's open, Father God. It is open. I pray that we would take advantage, Lord God, of being in your presence, Father God, because you have been so, so, so faithful to us and this church. You're calling us out for Wednesday, Lord God. And I pray that we would show up mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.